to another episode of the Studio 78 Podcast. I am your host, Nishé, from NishéSnow.com. Welcome! I'm so excited to be back. I know I've been on a little bit of a hiatus. I've just been working on all kinds of things. I've got some amazing opportunities lined up this year, but more on that on future episodes. Uh, this episode, I really just want to focus on Kara because Kara is amazing. She's from the Frugal Feminista, and I know you guys are going to love her. But before I get into that, one of the things that I've been working on is figuring out the best way for me to generate revenue so I can get more help in my business since I'm been, since I'm doing this nights and weekends and to help me with like maybe planning some in-person events and creating content and all of that good stuff. And one of the ways I've decided to do that is actually starting a membership page via Patreon. And it's an amazing platform for creators. What it does is it allows you as a listener to support, you know, your favorite creator, which in this case, I hope is me. Um, but you could go over to nishesnow.com slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and you can st- choose a tier, um, you know, from $5 where it's just saying, Hey, Nishé, I love you. I just want to support you. So you just pay $5 a month, or you could go with something like $12 a month where you could get exclusive videos and they will only be posted on this page. And they will only be for the people who are members on my Patreon site, or you could pay 24 where you get one exclusive video a month and one printable a month. And you guys know I love my printable. I just sent one out to my newsletter list. Or if you really want to donate a hefty sum, like 150, I have a tier where you pay 150 a month. And included in that is not only the exclusive video and the exclusive printables, but I will talk to you on a one hour call and listen to how your life is organized right now. And then we will figure out how to create a plan that will create more space for the things that you love. So there's a tier for a little bit of everybody. You can even add your custom amount. Like if you just wanted to donate $1 a month and say, hey, Nishé, just want to show my appreciation, you can do that. So that is one of the ways this year that I would love to generate income. So I can't wait to see what you guys think about it, but check me out in the slash Patreon, or just head on over to the Patreon website and search in snow. So enough about me. Let's talk about Kara Stevens. So excited to introduce you guys to her. She is the founder of the Frugal Feminista. We talk about why and how she got out of debt and her journey to starting the Frugal Feminista. But on top of that, we talk about how to change your money mindset, how hiring people can help you achieve your business goals, you know, options for diversifying your income. We talk a little bit about how to get over your fears and start making money. And we talk about just balancing a career, side hustle, and a family because a lot of us are doing our passion projects on the side? And how do you handle all of that, make money and make space for your loved ones? This conversation was just, it was fun, amazing. I know I left the conversation feeling it's inspired. And I just think she is the perfect person to start season four of the Studio 78 podcast. So without further ado, let's welcome Kara to the studio. Hello, Kara, and welcome to the Studio 78 podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to dig into your story. Um, but before we get into the Frugal Feminista, can you just tell the audience a little bit about your background? So before I, I started the Frugal Feminista, I um, was a classroom teacher Um, I taught the little ones. I taught kindergarten. I taught third grade, fourth grade. And then um, after that, I decided that I wanted to be a staff developer as an educator Mm. and became a staff developer for a number of years. And then after that, um, I became a middle school and an elementary school um, assistant principal and administrator. So Mm. that's 
happened. And during that time, it was during the time as a staff developer where I wasn't feeling the best about my career that Mm. I decided to start the Frugal Feminista. And so Mm. I had, um, the, the flexibility and determination, because when you do not like your job, you can find the time to do anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. No, that's so true. <laughs> I a blog post like, what? You know, just like on the like transportation, like I, I had like a long commute and I took the bus. So I made sure I got a seat. So I would do my post by hand sometimes or type it, you know, kind of use my iPhone and, and um, text it to myself. During my lunch breaks, I was trying to connect with um, influencers or sending out emails. So um, the Frugal Feminist has been a part of my career journey, but, you know, definitely its own entity as um, a business. Well, so what was like the catalyst, you know, that made you say like, hmm, I think I should, you know, start writing about finance, Well, I think it was because I was in student loan debt and my mama was looking at me crazy. So, and I was, uh, (laughs) and I remember graduating from college. I tell this story a lot because it's the truth that I was avoiding paying my credit card bills and Mm. I was, um, picked up the credit as a discover card. Oh, oh, they the worst. Yeah. And it was the same time I happened to be talking to my mom. The mail came through like the slot and I looked at the bill and I was like, why is the bill going up? Why is the balance going up? And I realized, oh, when you don't pay, they have a late (laughs) fee. And I was like, oh, are they asking me to pay this money? So my mom's like, please, do let me get your life together. And literally, (laughs) she's kind of looking at me disgusted. Like I raised you better than that. And I was like, I had graduated, already graduated from Oberlin. And one thing I did know about myself was that I could read a good, I could read a book. You know what I mean? I could read, I could read, right. I, I could, you know, put things into action. So I was like, well, since I don't know anything about this thing called like money, the way clearly I got paid. And the same thing I was doing with my student loans. Like I was like, why do they keep on sending me these bills? Like I, I didn't really want to pay them back, but I didn't realize that I had to pay them back because I signed a promissory note. Like no one really told me the connection between signing these things or getting these credit cards and the, it's mandatory that you pay them back. And right. so it was an aha moment for me. And then shortly after I went to the library and I found, and I swear, like it's almost like it was, I don't know, like destiny for me to find um, Glenda Bridgeforth's book and her series, Girl, Get Your Money Straight, Girl, Get Your Money Right. Because that was like the first Mm -hmm. book I've seen about personal finance, specifically targeting African-American women. And so the long and short of it was that still Glenda was clearly about 30 or 40 years older than I was. And as I got into reading about personal finance and then I was exposed to other black women personal finance writers, um, like Michelle Singletary, Mm -hmm. um, like Lynette Calfani, I began to realize that they were wonderful mentors, but that there was still a gap in speaking to black women at that age in their twenties. So I started a blog and it was like a, a nod to Glenda and it was called girl, um, get your life together. That (laughs) (laughs) was And so I would write about my personal finance problems and journeys. Um, you know, this is like before the travel movement, like the, the, the major black travel movement now. Mm-hmm. So my girlfriends and I were still wanting to travel. Um, we were trying to, you know, find love, whatever that meant, trying to find success. All the things they had promised us that would happen after college and they did not. <laughs> Right. It's like, wait a minute. Hold on. I graduated. What's going on here? (laughs) And I was expecting my life to be like a different world. I was going to get my Dwayne. Oh my goodness. Right. (laughs) Totally. So me like, just, I was just so upset. So I was like, I got to put this stuff together myself. So I, I was always a good writer. And so, um, I decided to chronicle and process my understanding of money, life, love as a, as a, a black woman in my twenties. And that's how it kind of started. Mm. It was just I used to send to my girlfriends and they would actually comment and it would resonate with them. So I started to write more and then I branched out into writing for a small Brooklyn black newspaper. And, you know, 
it just became something that was kind of fun for me to do because I, I love researching it now that I be, began to understand money and I started to see some progress with repaying my debt and becoming very career and money conscious at that time. It was like a great stage in my life, I believe, just to make sense of money in a way that um, gave the, in a way that allowed me time to make mistakes, but also to try out new things and see the success of it. Mm. No, I, oh my goodness. I, I love this so much. So people who've listened to the podcast for a nap for a while will know this, but new, for the new people, like, you know, I've told my story of getting out of over 40,000 in debt from like student loans and credit cards. And it was books like, uh, from Michelle Singletary, Glenn. I mean, I, I read everything, like even Susie Orman, Orman's yeah. book. I mean, everything. Cause I was just like, you know what? this is like, it's like a weight sitting on my chest. You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It was like the worst feeling ever just Mm -hmm. having these people who like wanted this money, right? Every month, regardless if you were making enough to pay it or not. (laughs) It's like super disrespectful. I'm like, oh, wow. No, but I mean, you had to pay it back because you got your education. So, I mean, I began to even understand my relationship with money um, through this journey. And I had to rewrite some of the money messages I had internalized growing up so I could actually be thankful for, um, basically people allow me to promising to repay the money. I mean, that's what a promissory right. note is. You're going to repay this money in exchange for the education, in exchange for the car, in exchange for, you know, at that time, Columbia House was selling um, re- um those those CDs. I'm, I'm really dating oh, myself. Oh, yes. I remember <laughs> that. <laughs> and I was like, I put them on a credit card. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> they want their money. You got your music. So I, I got it. I began to realize that it's, uh, it's an exchange. And sometimes... Uh, I mean, the interest rate, you know, is definitely a question of uh, not exploitation, but, you know, we don't have to have such high interest rates. But yeah. in terms of um, this concept of repaying something that you um, owe was something I had to grapple around and not feel resentment around because uh, ultimately that kind of mindset will keep me, I, say, I feel as a businesswoman, from creating the environment or the energy around receiving money or asking for money. Um, mm-hmm. I'll be on the other side, I'm on the other side now where I need people who say they're going to pay to pay that if I offer them a service that they will be, um, in, they'll do it in earnest and, and pay at the time. Or if I have like an installment plan, you'll pay on time or not try mm-hmm. and, um, take advantage of generosity. So it was helpful for me to try and, address some of those issues early on. Um, so it'll be, I'll be in a position later to establish that those expectations. No, I, I think that is so key. Cause I think sometimes people are like, well, Nishé, you know, you talk a lot about creative entrepreneurship, you know, product based business and things like that. But then you also talk about this lifestyle stuff, like getting your money together. And I always try to tell people like, if your money isn't together and if you don't have the right set, right mindset around money, you can't start a business and maintain it and be <laughs> fruitful. You know, you will have issues with saving money, earning money, asking for money. You know what I'm saying? Like, th- it's like there's so many issues that um, go wrong when you don't know how to like manage your money and be comfortable with money. And so that's why, you know, even having you on here is so amazing amazing because I really want to get that point across like, hey, you might have all these great ideas about your business, but if you're uncomfortable with money, you're not going to make any. Right. You know? (laughs) Yeah, I completely agree. And and another thing I I would also add is that you won't hire the people at the right, you know, if you, if you, Mm. that you resentful for paying someone what they charge, you may want to find sometimes a cheap alternative actually works, but then sometimes it doesn't. So being able to be comfortable with um, putting large amounts of money into um, a project and, and having to wait for it to materialize and having a long game is also an important part of dealing with money because you're not going to necessarily have an immediate return on your investment when mm. you're just beginning. And so yeah. I had, and I think, you know, these are certain things I still struggle with at, at certain points, but every time you level up in your mindset, it opens up to new problems. And then you get to level up again to see yourself grow with um, your business and also with your money. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, I found that at this stage, um, I've been able to hire a couple of people to help support the frugal feminista. And I realized I had to unpack certain money, um, hangups in order mm-hmm. for me to move to that next level. And, um, I think anyone that's trying to make sense of building a business, um, they definitely have to address any residual money, um, messages that make serve as an obstacle mm-hmm. from them reaching their income goals or reaching the networking piece that they may want to, or the relationships they want to create. Um, especially if money is the only thing that you're looking for, instead of looking at how can you partner with people who have similar visions, similar personalities or compatible personalities. So you guys can create something long-term, um, yeah. if things aren't addressed, then it's going to be very difficult for you to make progress. Mm, so agree. Mm-hmm. So I am um, sorry. I know I took us off on a little tangent there. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, so, so you're doing this, you're kind of like, okay, I'm on a bus, I'm <laughs> blogging away, you know, I'm just kind of putting out there what I'm learning. So how did, you know, how did that end up kind of growing and blossoming? If you could kind of just walk us through that. Mm. Well, um, I took a break from um, Girl Get Your Life Together, that blogspot.com, and I was just trying to you know, live life instead of maybe write about it. Mm. And I ended up reading, actually, I was reading another book on a bus, but I think it was like coming from like DC or, or um, someplace. And I had seen, it was a very, um, it was written by like a, a black woman about black women entrepreneurs. And mm. what was great about the book was that at the end of each chapter, this woman featured everyday local business owners that were doing whatever it is that she was talking about in that chapter. And Ooh. so I'm the kind of person that will, I will pick up a phone. Like if there's a phone number or an email, <laughs> I would call them, I would email them and I was like, excuse me, you're in New York. Can I meet you? And I actually did that. They were the get em girls. They had, um, this boutique, uh, this boutique, uh, catering company and they were from Brooklyn and I think from the South and they were local. And I just emailed them and said, Hey, you know, can I meet you? And I'm, I had, um, some flexibility. So I met them and I really, um, learned a lot from them about business. And so they, and at that time it was also when I wasn't feeling the best about my, my job. So I said, Hey, I'll quit my job and come work with y'all just like that. <laughs> right. and like, That's a lot. And I'm like, I know, but like, why don't we start, <laughs> why don't we start you writing some articles? And then they, and then, and then they talked also about, you know, you just don't have to write articles. You can do events and hear some ideas. So they helped me see the possibility of the frugal feminista at its beginning stages. So, mm. I was, oh, I could write, I can stage an event, I can get women together and talk and give a workshop. Like, and those are the things I was doing anyway at my day job. I was training right. and supporting. So, I was comfortable speaking to large groups of people, organizing uh, a workshop getting key points and key takeaways in a short period of time or a certain amount of time in an organized, structured way. So I was able to see the transfer. And then from that point, I started, I was like, oh, my love of the site or the idea of a business started to come again because I saw it in different eyes. So um, it still wasn't the frugal feminista yet. I decided that uh, to call it fabulous and frugal. That was the first Mm. name of the site. And so all the things that I had done from the articles, all the things that I had done um, from writing for that newspaper, all the things I had just been experiencing as a brown girl, you know, trying to live my life, blah, blah, blah. I was able to put that on the site. In addition to that, um, I decided to look for a, a business coach to help me figure out what else could I do. And so I mm. worked with a business coach for about 12 weeks to come up with some of the key elements or the cornerstones of the site. So I fleshed out my coaching packages. I went and got some training on how to be a life coach because I thought I wanted to do that. Um, I made myself, um, like, a you know, those one pages, like all those things and elements that will get you in a position to receive, um, receive, you know, mm-hmm. receive 
receive money and things like that. So, and then from there, I had small iterations and changes. But then the, it became the frugal feminista when I realized that I didn't, I didn't consider myself super fabulous in the conventional sense, like hair did, nails did, everything did. Like that wasn't necessarily my persona. Even though I do enjoy those kinds of things, I thought the frugal feminista as a feminist, as a black feminist and like a womanist, I thought that was more aligned to who I was and who I'll I'll still grow into. Mm, And so mm -hmm. I changed the name so I can talk about issues like friendship amongst black women, money and career and negotiations, like a, a, a range of what it means to have your money in various aspects of your life rather than just being about, you know, money and just tips and things like that. I could share my story and journey, um, with men and relationships with my mom and her relationship with money and just sharing all these things in a way that allows women to feel that they're not alone. They can, but they do also have some takeaways and some next steps. And so, Mm. uh, that's that's the the short version or kind of short version of <laughs> feminista from um you know just like this idea just to distract me you know from life to actually being something that could create sources of income mm Yes. And so I'm curious too for you because, you know, a lot of, I know creative entrepreneurs that are listening, you know, are maybe where you were then and they're like, but I don't know, how do I do a workshop? What if people don't come? Or what if I put out a training and no one signs up? Like, how did you get over those fears and just say like, okay, I'm going to do it and just like see what happens? Yeah, I think that people, I think people think that people are thinking about them more than they really are. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. I think that like, oh my God, my whole life is going to be over. And it's not. I mean, it's going to (laughs) be embarrassing for you momentarily, but it's also a learning, um, it's a learning curve. And I, I, I don't, I welcome those things. Those things have happened to me too, where you, you put together all this effort and then you have minimal um, impact in terms of income or minimal impact in terms of uh, attendance. And so what I think is, is that you have to think about, well, what could, what were the things that actually, what, what did I do? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And sometimes you find that maybe some of the things that I, I, that you did could have been done differently, or you didn't do all the things you say you were going to do to get the impact that you were looking for. And sometimes you realize that, especially in the beginning, that's the best time to make mistakes because no one's checking for you. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> right. You, you, you could treat people, you, as a matter of fact, like my philosophy has actually been like those three people, you treat them like it was a, a pack 300 crowd um, <laughs> um, event because those people will be your diehard fans. Like right. they're the ones that came through the rain. They're the ones that made sure that they paid on time. They got there on time. They came. Those are the people that you check for. Don't worry about the people that didn't come because those people are going to be your ambassadors and they'll be like, oh my God, you stay with them. You give them all the attention that you need. You take all the pictures that you want. You know, you add value to their lives and I promise you next time they'll bring people, you know, Mm -hmm. for you. And so I remember watching Boys to Men on an interview with HuffPost and Mm. their career has spanned in like two, three decades now. And I remember when they were at the high, they used to sell out seats and things like that. But they were sharing the story that Boys to Men had a crowd of 50 people. And I mean, compared to their notoriety and, and their level of influence, it, it could have been a very humbling moment. But they said, no, they sang their hearts out to the people that came. And that was yeah. always a reminder to me that, you know, this is a long game. Those those three people in that room, they may be connected to the hundred people for the next event because like, you know what, you treated me so well. You know, I got a cousin who works for IBM and mm-hmm. before, and that has happened to me several times. Just treat, I feel like in, in those instances, you pay attention to the people who are there and they'll take care of you. And I think you're yeah. also from the logistics side, you can see, well, what could have been done differently? But in terms of offering value to someone, you give them everything that you have because you don't really know what the future has in store and how those people in front can support you in getting you to, you know, spread your message, um, connect with people that can help you have a larger platform, you know, and, and that's been a, a great, um, 
mindset shift for me instead of saying, mm-hmm. well, it doesn't happen right away. It doesn't yeah. happen right away. You, you're sowing the seeds right now. Yeah, because for you, when did you, you know, after you decided, you know, because I know at some point you decided to go to the title, like the frugal feminista, but um, about how long after, you know, starting initially, did you say like, ooh, this could be something like, oh, my audience is starting to grow. Like I, I can maybe even earn a little extra money off of this, too. Hmm. It, it, it happened like in spurts because that's an important part of the story too. Like sometimes you'll be like in demand in certain ways. So I'll say this, that I had a company reach out to me to be an influencer and they paid me like more money than I've ever seen for. I was like, you want me to do what? For what? <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, uh, sure. <laughs> sure. Exactly. <laughs> that's like, oh, okay. People are watching. And what, uh, so I would say that happened maybe a year in, but also I had people, other say sites, um, based on the writing I had done for, as a freelancer. So mm. let me step back. So with the, with, if you're doing like something like a blog, remember, it's just not the blog that people are coming for. People are coming for you and for your expertise. So you can, as I mentioned before, you can translate that into freelance writing because your blog post can stay on your site, but you could write something similar for another site. So that makes you a freelancer. So you do freelance content. If you have a demographic like black business women or, um, black female professionals or white, white men between the ages of X, Y, and Z that love tech, you basically understand the psychographics of that demographic because it Mm -hmm. came. And so you can serve as a consultant for a company or, you know, so they can understand that demographic more because they're trying to reach them and they you may serve as a micro influencer to put that company's products and services if you um if they align with your mission and and your values in front of your audience Mm -hmm. so the second way that your blog isn't just about the writing it's about the person Mm -hmm. and and as a, a the leader of that community um additionally with that, even as a service or a product that a company is trying to get in front of your um, your audience, you can have passive income where just linking to that company's product or service gives you a small commission. They call it affiliate um, commission. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's another piece of it. And then from the community itself, you can coach them. So if you have if like, like, like for you, Nishay, if you, you know, want to help black women entrepreneurs who are still trying to figure out if it's this going to be their full time, their part time and mm-hmm. you experience, you can help them organize their thinking around how do I manage my time? How much am I going to uh, actually budget for my company? How much am I going to put towards um, marketing or how much one put towards actually getting a virtual assistant? You can actually help them with that, you know, mm-hmm. so they six or seven streams of income I already talked about um, just by having this blog and allowing that to transform into corporate relationships, like where you do business to business and also like business to customer relationships when you do coaching um, and maybe where um, you do like retreats and workshops for women in your community or the people in your community. Mm, no, they're all great ideas. Look, I need to get on it. <laughs> I guess I like, how to get that. So with the frugal feminist, they first start with like a company reaching out to me, but then also start with like a a, a, a corp like a corporation. Then also came I started to realize that smaller um, influential blogger um, creatives were reaching out to me to help them with a particular um, project, and mm. then people from my community would say, well, can we have more of this? And I started to create webinars for my community. So mm-hmm. based on what they were saying were their needs. And so depending on your personality, your schedule and what your business model is, um, you can determine what you want to do more of because they're, they're drawbacks to each, um, each model or each stream of income, their drawbacks and their benefits to each, but it's definitely dependent on, on your personality. Now, which I totally agree because uh, my next question, because uh, 
for me, you know, I work full time and then I do like pot, you know, the podcast and then blogging, you know, on my nights and weekends. And mm-hmm. so, you know, we talked a little bit um, before I hit the record and you also do this on your nights and weekends mm-hmm. and you have some little ones, like you have a family too. Mm-hmm. So how do you balance it all? Like, how do you, how did, you know, how do you stay sane? <laughs> Oh, that's a different question. Um, the same sanity. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I think that. <laughs> you know what I think? I think that early on I learned that I needed help, and I mm. think that um, when you have the great thing about having a full time job is that you have hopefully money that you can use to put into your business. And I would say if you are straddled in debt and you're struggling in your personal finances, that you may want to shore that up, get out of debt first. Um, mm-hmm. like first, it was like a har- large amount of money, but credit card debt and those things like that, because it's going to be very difficult for you to not feel the stress of those, um, that burden when you're trying to invest in your business. So if you have a full-time job and you are in a decent position to fund and invest in your business, um, you're able to buy, buy your time. So mm. You can pay an assistant to do your social media. You can pay an assistant to do your public relations. And I do these things myself. So um, I have um, someone, I say, okay, I know what I need. I need to be able to get onto podcasts. I need to get um, some publicity. So I have someone that I say, okay, here is my, I write the script myself. Like, here's the intro that I want you to, here's the intro that I want to, here's my intro. And the email, I want you to research a hundred podcasts that are about black women, entrepreneurship, lifestyle, money, mindset, or whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And then to email them, but keep it in my draft folder so I can find, have the final say and send it out each time. Right. Yeah. Rather than me sitting up there writing a hundred emails, that's me buying my time, even though I started the project, but I, I delegated so that's mm-hmm. one. Um, I think also because you have a full time job, you are going to need a lot of that kind of thinking so you can move from just a beginner stage to a stage where your your baby, where your business has some is crawling because they'll forever be in that, you know, baby position where they're on their back and they're not moving. And you may get you may get um, disappointed and, and disillusioned. So you mm-hmm. would want to that you want to use your money to move to that stage as quickly as possible. And I think that is where a lot of us get the frustration that it's not moving quickly. But if you have a full-time job, it's never going to move quickly if you're doing it by yourself. So I think that getting help um, is the most um, important. And then also having having a product that you want to create. So I would say early on, what is it that you're trying to sell? Um, Mm -hmm. And if time job, selling services may be a difficult thing if you finding flexibility in your day is a hard thing. So what you may want to do, unless the price point is so high that one sale of that service is going to hold you in a great position for a couple of months, it may be worthwhile. But if you are trying to um, use your full-time job to support you creating a, a, a product that can be sold without you actually exchanging your time for it is another idea that you may want to consider or, uh, the structure of one to many, like, mm-hmm. a, you know, so yeah. those all had to decide early on because what I, what I didn't want were, was that my relationships to suffer and they can suffer if you, if you have a full-time job, if you're a working parent, a lot of your time is accounted for anyway. So mm-hmm. we want your health to, to dip. We also don't want the significant person in your life to be insignificant. Cause like, I'm tired of this. Do you know I mean you hold on? <laughs> right. Like all you do is work. You work, right, right. you come home, you work, you work on weekends. <laughs> right, exactly. So I will carve out time for personal fulfillment because sometimes as a long game, You may not see the results that you want, but you want to still stay enthusiastic about the process. So you take care of yourself emotionally, you know, through your relationships, through your friendships and things like that. So um, 
that's how I would say like how I manage it is it, and I wasn't doing it well all the time so I'm just just being completely honest that you know <laughs> this all this all comes from like oh I should I should have done something differently so I would say look here I want to work for so you can do it two ways I feel like is it hour based what is it that you want to do you want to put 10 hours into your business a week okay or which I find to be more um, in my wheelhouse, I want to accomplish these three or four things, um, for the, the day. And also you can batch it. I'm going to give you all the Like say you, you do pot, be your, your podcast and Shay. So I'm only doing podcasts on Saturdays. That's it from nine to 12. And if you can't get in those, that 12- schedule, then see you next time. You know what I mean? Because 12 yeah. is my, um, soul cycle class. I am not <laughs> this one. You know what I mean? Like right. I try to get everything right in the summer. So, <laughs> No, it's true. So because you have to find balance because this is the kind of stuff that will consume your time. And then you may feel burnt out um, before you even see some of the the fruit of your your labor. I agree 100 percent with everything, like even with what, what, what you first started with. Sometimes people roll their eyes when I say this, but I always tell people because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to quit my job. They see all these people on Instagram and stuff and they're like, I'm just going to quit. And I'm like, that works for some people. I've e- even interviewed some people that that's worked for. But I'm like, for most people, it doesn't. So it's like, make sure you get out of debt first. Make sure you save up like six months worth of income. Right. And <laughs> then from there, you'll have a little bit of freedom. And like you said, too, you can start hiring people while you have a full-time job. And then if from there, you're like, oh my goodness, um, I think I want to do this full-time, then you can make that jump. You know, I always stress that to people because I feel like sometimes, and I've had guests to talk about this too, where they've jumped before they were ready. And then they end up having to like, go back to like a nine to five and then rethink their business. And then years later, do Mm -hmm. it again, because they've saved money, they've thought through the process, how they're going to chunk out their time, how they're going to hire for help, how they're going to do all these things like that you've mentioned. So those are like some really key points. Yeah. Yeah. You may also another strategy is just to work part time, you know, so if you decide that you um, don't want to wait until the money of six months comes, but you don't mind um, still working a bit, but you can work for a short amount of time that gives you that, that bit of stability and consistent income, but then gives you more time to, you know, to, to pursue whatever it is that, that you're going to pursue. But I, I find that, um, sometimes, you know, it depends, like it really depends on the, I think that this whole entrepreneur, like, you know, jump in the, the net will appear and stuff. It's good for mm-hmm. some people, like you said, but sometimes people like having a side hustle because it's just that, a side hustle, something they enjoy doing and mm-hmm. that um, they may realize that even things that you really love to do, when you do them a lot and it becomes like work, it's work. You know what I mean? So sometimes that joy may not be there for them um, when they actually do it full time. So I think the benefit of working full time and having your side hustle is to really determine, is this something that I love doing? Is working for myself something that I really want to do? Or is it something like, and I've grown to see this in myself, the frugal feminista is one of many things that I want to pursue as a business person. But my ultimate goal, I'm looking to create um, passive income. That's my mm-hmm. goal, ultimately. So mm-hmm. I do speaking, but ultimately, this is not something I want to do permanently because it's not a passive form of in, a passive stream of income. I prefer to create products and services up front and then receive um, the income, um, you know, without me having to exchange my time for it in real time. So I think ultimately, the more you get to play with the ideas within the safety of having a job and then pursuing and making mistakes and things like that, you really get to determine what you really, really want, you know, for yourself. No, I 100% agree with that because I was just talking to one of uh, my business besties the other day. And, you know, I was telling her, you know, I've had like side hustles that have made me like a decent amount of money, like especially when I did graphic and web design, Um, even when I did kind of like some laser cutting. But what I told her, which is one of the reasons why I ended up starting this podcast and this kind of brand a few years ago is, or a couple of years ago, I guess now it's crazy, is because I was like, I need something that doesn't require so much of my time. Because with that, it's like, 
I had to update the websites. I have to create the graphics, right? I have to create the products that go out. And I'm like, I need something more passive because the, maybe the time I had back then to do all those things, I don't have that time now. So I'm like, you know, it's like looking at like that next stage, like, okay, how can you write like package up like what you know, share it with others, but in a way where you're not giving up you know, a ton of your time. Cause I know with even passive income, you know, of course you have to update things and there's like marketing involved, but it's a lot less than, you know, being present for like a course or taking five coaching calls a week, you know? Um, so that's interesting, uh, that you mentioned that. Cause I'm kind of like in that same phase too, where it's thinking through like, okay, how could I make this more passive, but still have huge impact? Right. The thing is, I, I completely understand because um, I wrote two books, um, largely because I like to write, but also because I realized that um, they don't make tons of money, but um, yeah. they, but you can sell them in bulk, you know, so you can pitch to bookstores, college um, student services where, you know, you can sell 100 or sell 200 just like that, just through a conversation or a series of emails as opposed to, and then that can lead into maybe... Um, you know, speaking engagement, but on your time at your, at your convenience. So there's not this sense of you have to fight for every bit that you have. And then you can ask for referrals for other universities or organizations that are looking for books like this or or resources like that. So I think that, um, and that's what any, any product, any, any product that you have that can be sold to many people at one time, um, mm-hmm. without you having to do anything other than make the connection. So passive doesn't mean that you don't do any work. It's just like how you do the work. Yeah. Um, you do the emails and you set up the systems to get people into your funnel and communicate with them and you ask for the referrals. And so that is work, you know, but it's the idea that I could, since I have a small child, I can not have to be away for her, away from her, since I'm already away from her for nine to five to do the, um, to do the, the frugal feminista. Um, it could be a matter of emails or, you know, um, a matter of phone calls or, um, you know, maybe a conference call or something like that. So I think it's mm-hmm. for people. And I also think on like a, just on a different note that as we pursue these ideas of like business and, um, uh, money and things like that, I think it's important for us also to uh, think about what your definition of success is and how much money do you really need to be happy? You know, right. like Instagram, Instagram is like, I'm making, you know, six figures. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's great. Um, but but they so, could be living, pay, you know, paycheck to paycheck. Like, it's like, right. okay, but where's that money going? Are they spending it well? And money doesn't bring people happiness either, you know? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The expenses are. So I always listen to like, yeah, I, I, I brought in, you know, six figures. Like, well, did you have six figure expenses? You know, like when you look down <laughs> with. No, but it's true. Like that's how I don't believe yeah. Instagram. Just like in general, I don't. But I think also it's important that we figure out. Like I'm in this business for what? Is it for more time freedom? The, like the kind of like the lifestyle I want to be able to, you know, do things with my time that I couldn't do with a nine to five. Is there a certain amount of money that that? And what's the money associated with that? What's the actual bottom line with that? I think that's also important because you may realize that you may be looking to make. You know, you want to build your empire, as we all like to say, but you'll be happy with sixty, seventy thousand dollars working for yourself. Or you may realize that, hey, maybe I should just get I could just invest this money um, with like a financial advisor. And that's probably more my speed than actually having a business. And that's okay, You know, so I think that our our current trend is like build your own business, be your own boss. But if you don't like to work and I'm not like a, I don't love work in general. If Mm -hmm. I can find a way to create um, income without me necessarily having to show up at some place, that's ideal for me. So I think it's important for us to really think about, well, what does it look like? What I want my ideal, ideal day to be like, and how does money fit into that? And how does the business allow or serve as a vehicle to achieve that? Oh, I so agree. Um, Cause I was just like, even, 
laughing with a friend the other day um, and I was telling her because she was like um, making fun of me because like on my Instagram stories I always have like I'm going to the stationery store and I'm like it looks like I'm buying a lot of stuff but I'm like people what people don't know is I put 20% away of every check into a savings right. account right okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're not around stationery right. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, I'm like, people need to, number one, just make sure you're not comparing yourself to others. But number two, really figure out like, how much money do you need in order to live the life you want? And you just need to be smart about the way you're living. Because I do know like way too many people that are living well beyond their means just to have like the best shoes and the best this and that and to travel and this and that. And it's like, okay, that's great. If you like that and you want that lifestyle, that's amazing. But you need to figure out how to make enough money that you can afford that lifestyle. (laughs) So you're just not looking like you can on Instagram or wherever else, because ultimately you're not going to be happy because you're going to be struggling. You got bill collectors calling you. You can't really buy what you want. You barely can afford like food to eat every week because you're, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. No, I completely agree. And I think going back to like the whole, this is like the, the, the great point of this show. And, and I'm glad that you have it is like to help us really understand like what's important, like how, and like, and how do you create a, a solid financial foundation for, you know, personally and in terms of your business. And that always begins with like having a clear assessment of your why and then having a budget and a spending plan that goes with it. No one's telling you you can't travel, but maybe you can't travel four times a year to very um, exotic places at the peak of the time that (laughs) travel season happens. You know what I mean? Like you're really, you're really messing yourself up to be in debt when you can get it at, you can still have the experience, you know, the experience of say going to Bali. Now, do you have to go to Bali first class and have a five, uh, a four star hotel treatment with luxury Butler and things like that? Okay. Then save up for it. No one's saying that you can't, but don't, don't expect other people to pay for it. And I mean, exactly. other people need your credit card too. Do you know what I mean? Because you're like, you get what you want the money back. You know, if you, you kind of have to deal with the consequences of each of your financial behaviors. And I think if we can understand that, then you can begin to be like a financial adult, you know? Yeah. And so you can go, Nisha, you can go to your stationery store and, exactly. and like, you, ready, you did your adult behavior come to your money. You That's what I always tell people. And then I was telling the same person too. And I was like, on the flip side of that, You know, someone might say like, oh, well, why don't you just buy that? Or why don't you just, oh, if you want to go there on a trip, just go there. And I'm like, just because you can doesn't mean you should either. And I think sometimes people don't realize that. Like, yeah, "Yeah, but is it worth you spending X amount of dollars, right? You know, or should you wait to the off season or wait till you saved up or, you know, like whatever it might be. And so, yeah, it's just getting kind of like your mind right about about finance. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of my, my, um, one of the books that really influenced my thinking just in general and, um, was a book by uh, her name is Juliet Shore. It's called the overspent American. She's Ooh. a professor, I think at Boston university now, but I mean, I don't remember at the time of the book, but basically the premise of the book is this, is that we, um, we competitive, competitively consume, meaning that <laughs> the only reason that you want to go to Bali is because Bali is something that is impressive. What you think to other people as impressive, it will make you seem as if you have a particular status. And we were, we were very familiar with the idea of, um, um, conspicuous consumption. Mm-hmm. And so the reason that you have these very outlandish and very, um, extravagant tastes is not because you actually want those things. Maybe you just want to go to the botanical gardens and read a book. Do you know what I mean? But that's not going to get you oohs and ahs and likes on Instagram, Facebook, and on Snapchat. So right. you kind of <laughs> curate these kinds of very full, um, these, these full, um, identities so people can, you know, feel not as good as you, I guess, I guess the big is the whole point is to, to be, to win the competition. And so ultimately you use money as this, um, this weapon, so to speak, to win, um, in terms of status. And what's happening is that, um, that creates anxiety for other people, depending on how strong their, their constitution is, they may do the mm-hmm. same thing. Um, so for those people that find themselves competitively consuming, 
um, stop going on social media because it can act, <laughs> contribute to that, you know, take a <laughs> break. Um, or, you know, maybe if you want to be an uh, Instagram pioneer and warrior and say, hey, guys, like, let me actually show what it really looks like after. Maybe you can put a picture up of your, your trip and then you can put a picture up of your bill that comes right. with it. You can, <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> that reality. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, that's not it. That's not your responsibility, but it is your responsibility to be smart about understanding why human behavior around money can be very predictable. You know, when it yeah. comes to um, having these these spaces where we can show off and show elements and parts of our life and curate them. So, if you haven't figured that out yet, that's going to be a definite um, problem to your finances. Absolutely. Well, I just have a few wrap up questions. Oh my God, I could just talk to you all day. I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> like, she got things to do today. I'm like taking up all her time. <laughs> um, so, just a few wrap up questions. The first one, oh, excuse me. The first one is how do you stay organized? So, to help me stay organized, I use Asana, um, which is like a digital um, project management tool. That allows me to leave um, the women that support me the to-do list of what needs to be done and create dates for it and keep communication open. And I also use email um, for myself to communicate with, um, you know, brands and things like that. Um, So, yeah. And I use like, you know, my I still am old school. I love my pen and paper. So my to-do list for myself, um, Mm -hmm. I keep it in a notebook Mm -hmm. or in a journal. Yeah, I'm a big journal person too. Mm -hmm. Um, And then what's your favorite tool or software? I like Zoom. Mm, Yeah. Yeah, Zoom helps me meet with clients one-on-one. You can record it and um, there's a free version, which is great. So you don't have to commit um, and you don't have to to money that may not be, you know, well invested at that time, but you can upgrade if you need to. Perfect. And then last but not least, where can the listeners find you? Oh, yay. So um, you can find me on the gram, you know, Instagram, Frugal Feminista, Twitter, Frugal Feminista, and Facebook, The Frugal Feminista. And, you know, LinkedIn, too, um, has been very good to me in terms of connecting with um, all different types of people. And it's Kara Stevens, um, The Frugal Feminista, on in, on the LinkedIn. And you can always email me at Kara at TheFrugalFeminista.com. Perfect. Kara, thank you so much for sharing your story and just like your wisdom. So I I know that this is going to impact somebody and they in 2019 or whenever they listen to it, it could be 2020, (laughs) they are going to get their sales together. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. This was a great conversation. What did I tell you guys? Don't you all feel pumped. Okay. Let's get our money right, ladies. Let's do this. Anywho, to find show notes for this page, head on over to nishesnow.com slash 75. All the books she mentioned, including hers, I have links to. And also the tools that she mentioned, like Asana and Zoom, I have links to that. I mean, you guys, I mean, so much goodness in here. I think What I really want you guys to take home is it's okay to make money because sometimes I think we're afraid to make money and we're afraid to pay for help because we're not sure if we're going to make enough to cover that help. But you know what? Believe in yourself. Do what you need to do to generate that income. You can do it. I believe in you. Believe in yourself. Kara believes in you. Let's do this. All right? Anyway, if you love this episode and you love the podcast and you also love the other content I produce, please think about becoming a member over on my Patreon page. That's nishesnow.com slash Patreon. There'll also be a link to that in the show notes. And I will catch you guys next week and bring you all another amazing guest. All right. Take care. Have a beautiful week. 